where it was a fortuitous piece of luck. But when it comes to finding Saddam, luck seems to be as elusive as the man himself. In the summer of 2003, theories abound as to where he is and where he has been since the start of the war. There could be a number of, uh, of tricks up his sleeve. Uh, he's been very wily and very clever. According to some U.S. and Middle Eastern intelligence sources, Saddam leaves Baghdad for Syria about one week after the first strike against him. They believe he spends 10 to 12 days in the town of Latakia until the Syrians, fearing discovery and reprisals by the Americans, kick him out. I think if the Syrian government in particular had had their hands on him, they would have hung on to him and probably sold him to us for some really high stakes. Those same intelligence sources say when Saddam leaves Syria, he flies to Minsk, Belarus, a theory bolstered by the fact that his personal secretary is captured with dozens of blank Belarusian passports and several million dollars on him. From Minsk, these sources say, Saddam later flies to Libya, but stays only briefly. Going to Belarus or to Libya, you know, I, I find that to be really fanciful. I just don't think that's, that's likely to be true. He wouldn't trust himself to people like that. According to one of Uday's former bodyguards, Saddam never left Iraq. As coalition bombs pummeled Baghdad in March, Saddam stayed put in safe houses. In April, as tanks rolled into Baghdad, he made a surprise television appearance. In the videotape, he's seen surrounded by a throng of supporters. As Baghdad fell around him, Saddam apparently hid in plain sight showing up at a mosque for Friday prayers just two days after coalition forces took Baghdad. And in the ultimate show of hubris, he drove through the streets of Mansoor in unmarked cars right past a convoy of U.S. troops and tanks. Wouldn't surprise me if Saddam just took a couple of his bodyguards, hopped into, let's say, a Toya land cruiser and just started driving around uh, Iraq inconspicuously. By mid-April, Saddam may believe it's time to get out of Baghdad and head for friendlier territory in Iraq. But how can he avoid detection when the city is crawling with U.S. soldiers and Marines? I think just get in a car and drive. Uh, you send people ahead, you have radio communications, you find out if there are checkpoints. When you see checkpoints, you can radio back to somebody or call on the cell phone. Now that does potentially compromise him. Given that he places an emphasis on personal survival, he moves in a, a mobile command vehicle. There are long periods of time where he doesn't talk, and it's a very, very difficult intelligence problem. But if in July 2003, the hunt for Saddam Hussein is proving next to impossible, so is the search for America's other arch enemy, Osama bin Laden. While the intensive hunt for Saddam ultimately proves successful, the search for Osama bin Laden is proving to be much more frustrating. Like Saddam Hussein, he has a $25 million bounty on his head, yet he remains at large. To date, neither human nor electronic intelligence is effective in capturing the world's most infamous terrorist. We simply have failed in everything we have done to get neutralized or otherwise uh, take uh, Osama bin Laden out of the picture. Osama bin Laden's terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, has deep roots in Afghanistan. His ties to this bleak, militantly Muslim land date to the early 1980s when he took part in the Afghan-Soviet war. It is a place he knows like the back of his hand. It is here that he establishes camps to train thousands of men for his terrorist army. And the Saudi-born millionaire stays in contact with his Al-Qaeda operatives around the world. It was very possible to find out what he was doing on the internet and on uh, with fax machines and with uh, cell phones and all this kind of stuff. The National Security Agency starts tracking bin Laden's activities in the early 1990s. Its most potent surveillance weapon is the top secret software program called Echelon. In 1996, Echelon pins down bin Laden's telephone number in Afghanistan. He was using a service known as Immarsat, which is a, a satellite system used by ships at sea and explorers in remote areas. And, uh, he would use that phone and uh, NSA would listen right in. But in August of 1998, 
Echelon fails to detect any signals that Al-Qaeda plans to car bomb two U.S. embassies in Africa. Two weeks later, there is an intercept from bin Laden's phone that indicates he is going to a camp in Afghanistan for a meeting. The U.S. responds to this news with cruise missiles, but bin Laden is gone an hour before the camp is destroyed. In the latter half of 1998, Bin Laden discovers that U.S. intelligence has been eavesdropping on him, and he stops using his phone. His lieutenants continued to use the phone, but he stopped using it, which made it very difficult for us to know what it, uh, what it was he was doing, and, of course, hindered our ability to track his movements and find him. And that lack of information proves deadly. U.S. intelligence has no clear advance warning of the horrors of September 11th. After these attacks, President George W. Bush makes the hunt for Osama bin Laden his top priority. I want justice. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. In October of 2001, the president orders U.S. troops into Afghanistan. Their task is to overthrow the extremist Taliban regime that harbors al-Qaeda, and shut down the terrorist bases. The main goal is finding Osama bin Laden. There is great confidence that he will be taken quickly. A month into the war, a predator spy plane zeroes in on a high-level Al-Qaeda meeting outside Kabul. U.S. intelligence is certain bin Laden is there. A U.S. airstrike on the site kills Mohammed Atef. Al-Qaeda's military chief, but bin Laden gets away. Then, in December 2002, American intelligence picks up bin Laden's trail in eastern Afghanistan. And one of the people associated with him was using a uh, satellite phone or a cell phone, and um, the U.S. was monitoring that, and that's why they were closing in on uh, bin Laden at that point up in Tora Bora. The forbidding white mountains of Tora Bora form a natural border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda troops are believed hiding within its sprawling complex of caves. In mid-December, the U.S. sends a makeshift army of Afghan mercenaries along with some American special forces to get Bin Laden. But as they advance on the Al-Qaeda stronghold, they meet fierce resistance. The Afghans refuse to move forward. The hunt for bin Laden is stalled. The U.S. calls in an airstrike, and American B-52s pound the southern Afghan side of Tora Bora with huge bombs. But unwilling to anger Pakistan, a U.S. ally, they leave the Pakistani side of Tora Bora untouched. This leaves a wide open escape route for bin Laden, and he slips away. He just got to be very lucky. We didn't have enough troops and didn't, couldn't close the encirclement around him. Two weeks after the initial assault on Tora Bora, additional U.S. ground forces arrive for the final push. All they find now are abandoned caves with tons of supplies and a small group of Al-Qaeda and Taliban. The initial optimism of finding bin Laden fades with each day. Indicators were there. And now indicators are not there, so maybe he still is there, maybe he was killed, or maybe he's left. It is now likely that bin Laden and many of his al-Qaeda are in the tribal area of northwest Pakistan, ruled by Pashtun chiefs. This fundamentalist Muslim enclave has its own dialect and ancient customs. Outsiders are not welcome. And although bin Laden and his top aides have multi-million dollar bounties on their heads, the Al-Qaeda fugitives are now surrounded by Islamic zealots who have little use for reward money. To give him up in order to make their own lives easier is something which they would think was in fact threatening to the salvation of their souls. The U.S. has few options in going after bin Laden in this region. Pakistan doesn't want American troops on its soil. And there are also elements within Pakistan's intelligence service that remain friendly to the Taliban and sympathetic to bin Laden and his cause. 
Former CIA officer Larry Johnson has talked to sources knowledgeable about the situation on the ground in Pakistan. I've heard very clearly that elements of the uh, Pakistani intelligence service are protecting him. He's being sheltered. In 2003, the hunt for bin Laden enters its second year, and the trail remains cold. Month by month, fewer and fewer resources are being put into bin Laden as the U.S. focuses on Iraq and Saddam Hussein. On March 20, 2003, the war in Iraq begins, and for all intents and purposes, the hunt for bin Laden ends. And despite the fall of Baghdad and the capture of Saddam Hussein, there is still no resolution to American involvement in Iraq. The war in Iraq has diverted not only political attention, but it's diverted intelligence resources, it's diverted military forces. Uh, the notion that we can do a lot of things well at the same time is simply not true. In fact, the U.S. disbands Task Force 11, the special ops group formed to find bin Laden, to fold its elements into Task Force 20, so all the effort devoted to going after Saddam Hussein is effort that goes away from finding and locating the al-Qaeda terrorists. Today in Afghanistan, a reduced presence of coalition troops tries to police a vast and hostile territory. Attacks by resurgent Taliban forces are increasing, and there are rumors that they are reinforced by al-Qaeda from Pakistan. And so far, there is still no sign of Osama bin Laden. The failure to find bin Laden is, to me, uh, represents a much more serious threat to the United States and to its people. Uh, us, no matter how terrible Saddam was, he wasn't a direct threat to us. But there's no doubt that bin Laden was a clear, direct threat to us. And we so far let him off the hook. July 2003. After months of failed hits and bad tips, the search for Saddam Hussein, the number one target and the biggest manhunt in history, gains new momentum. Following the deaths of his sons in a fierce battle with U.S. forces, there is a significant increase in human intelligence as more and more Iraqis come forward with information. I think it becomes imperative, and it's well understood by U.S. force commanders in Iraq, that we have to find the man. Either we capture him or we kill him. Or if he's already dead, we have to find the body. Still, in the summer of 2003, putting Saddam in the crosshairs is proving to be extremely difficult. He has an entire arsenal of survival techniques at his disposal, including about a half dozen lookalikes, some of them surgically altered to better resemble him. There have been concerns as to whether the person who would surrender would in fact be uh, Saddam Hussein, whether it would be a double. Uh, the doubles, uh, at least I'm under the impression, they're uh, very, uh, very good doubles. He maybe has some trick up his sleeve by convincing us for a time that uh, one of his doubles is really him and he goes one way and somebody else goes another. And the real Saddam may no longer look the same. U.S. intelligence sources believe he might change his appearance to elude capture. In August 2003, the CIA digitally alters several photos of him and distributes them to U.S. troops and Task Force 20, the secret of special ops unit leading the hunt. The photo shows Saddam with a beard, Saddam dressed as a Bedouin, Saddam with silver hair looking like a kindly old uncle, Saddam with no mustache. By September, he could be underground. He has an elaborate system of bunkers and tunnels. U.S. intelligence identified more than two dozen of these installations during the first Gulf War in 1991. But they believe there may be more now, and some might be located under hospitals or mosques, sites not likely to be targets of American bombs. U.S. forces occupying Iraq search for maps or blueprints of the new bunkers and tunnels, and the engineers who designed them but they're unlikely to find them. Once Saddam realizes that you're an engineer and you know too much about where he could hide, he's going to have you killed. Not fearing reprisals from Saddam, the German engineers who designed one of the underground fortresses revealed the blueprints. This 20,000 square foot bunker was built under one of Saddam's palaces at a cost of $90 million. It has luxurious bedrooms and is stocked with enough food and water to last a year. 
and with giant shock absorbers, it's designed to withstand multiple bomb blasts and missile strikes. There are some very, very 